Moving to a new country can be a difficult experience. New food, new language, new culture. It can be overwhelming and even scary. Adventists in South Korea wanted to create a space to help people integrate into the country while feeling supported. The Adventist Multicultural Family Service Center is an urban center of influence situated in a diverse area in the city of Ansan, where many foreigners come to work. Most of them don't know how to speak, read, or write the Korean language when they arrive, so the center offers free Korean language courses. More than 400 people go through this program every year. A few years ago, the staff at the center developed a plan to improve and expand their operations. This new plan offered a holistic experience to others in the community. Some of the most widely used services are the center's various shelters. These include an emergency shelter for those who have no income or housing and group shelters for single parents. The families who stay in the shelters are offered free meals as well as safety. Many of the foreigners don't know how to navigate the healthcare system. So the center provides free dental care services once a week and general medical treatments once a month. Additionally, visitors have access to counseling services. As a result of the center's presence in the community, a number of new congregations have formed in a variety of languages. Groups meet and worship in Russian, English, Urdu, Chinese, and Korean. They have been blessed with up to 30 baptisms in a single year. The center has a heavy focus on children and youth. First, a kindergarten was established. Then, an after-school program was created for elementary students. This gave parents a place to send their children for tutoring and after-school care. For the parents who needed to work late, the center established a night protection care program where children would be supervised until 9 o'clock in the evening. The Korean Russian School Academy for elementary and secondary students is especially popular. There are more than 60 students enrolled. The staff at the center see new, exciting opportunities to connect with families, but they need your help. This quarter, a portion of the 13th Sabbath offering will help provide other care services for immigrant children in Ansan, South Korea. Please consider what you can give to this opportunity. Thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering. We want to continue to pray for God's blessings upon each one. Today is the fourth message in a series looking at James and Jesus and how James in the book of James, the, the letter that he wrote, is reflecting the things that he learned from Jesus. And uh, he had a lot of time to learn from Jesus, didn't he? Being Jesus's older stepbrother. And uh, the very same James who uh, became the spokesman for the early church. We'll talk about that again in just a moment. Um, each, of, each of the messages stands alone, so if you didn't hear message one, two, or three, then today stands alone. But you can always go back and look online and uh, see those messages. And I asked last week if any of you have done the homework I assigned to you, and nobody did it really, but maybe somebody did this week. <laughs> look at those red words of Jesus if you have a red letter edition of the Bible. And then compare with what it is in the book of James that he said, and you're gonna see so much. And uh, you might say, well, that's exactly what I did to come up with these messages. To an extent, that's true. Um, I also shared out to you that um, the book of James is not appreciated by a number of folks. 
There are those who see James as being rather harsh, missing out on the point of the gospel and the grace of God. And really this disappoints me because to me, James has the voice of Jesus so powerfully. And I see grace in what he says. A grace that does not say you have to do in order to be saved, but if you are saved, then you will do. You understand what I just said? Salvation changes us. And that's what the book of James is about. And he's saying, if you are not being changed into the image of God, can you really show me that you have faith? I don't see James as harsh at all. I see him as a wonderful reflection of Jesus and identifying with grace and the power of grace to transform lives. And I'm sure that James was respected in his day as, as much as I respect him today, probably more so, for those who knew him and loved him. Because it was Paul and Barnabas when they were having issues and things were coming up of what should we teach the people to do and what do we not have to teach the people to do? Do we have to make people into Jews in order to be Christians? And the answer was, no, you don't. You don't. We come to Christ as we are for salvation. And uh, so now to the letter of James. We're going to begin in James 1 today. We've been skipping around. James 1, starting in verse 9. But before we read it, I ask you to pray with me one more time. Lord Jesus, we bow before you this morning thanking you for the recorded words in our Bible of what you said, thanking you for what James wrote, for what every one of the writers of the Bible were inspired to write to share with us today. And may your Holy Spirit, the same one that inspired the writers of the Bible, inspire us with understanding. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So James 1, starting in verse 9, verses 9 through 11, James writes, this is the first of three passages we're going to look at at James on this topic that's scattered throughout the book. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flowers fall and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. What is James talking about? Well, not surprisingly, it sounds a lot like something Jesus himself said. Do you recall any words of Jesus that sound kind of like this? You'll find them in Matthew 6. Matthew 6, starting at verse 28. Jesus said, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Our faith and our trust is supposed to be in God, right? To take care of us, we don't have to worry. And if we're challenged financially, God can take care of us. And if we're wealthy, don't let it go to your head. Because someday you won't be anymore. <laughs> we all have to trust in God. What do you hear them saying? Keep your priorities right. Keep a humble spirit. Trust in God. It reminds me of some recent sayings that, well, more recent, likely. Have you ever heard the saying, bloom where you're planted? Bloom where you're planted, wherever you are. Make the best of it. Enjoy life. Do good. Bloom where you're planted. Perhaps you've heard this saying, don't get caught up in the rat race. Some of you have heard that one. Don't get caught up in the rat race. It's kind of related to um, a Time article that I found online. I was reading in it, and it said an amazing thing, having somewhat to do with the rat race. But what it said is, in a study, 
they've discovered that the more materialistic people are, the less satisfied they are with their lives. The more focused on things, the less satisfaction with real life. Wow. Goes along exactly with what we're talking about today. Plant where you're, bloom where you're planted. Be happy when you're exalted, but don't let it go to your head. Be humble. James and Jesus direct us to the futility of materialism. James takes the illustration to the discussion of, of, of wealth. He talks about wealth. He advises the lowly brother to enjoy whenever he gets some special recognition in one way or another. But to the rich, be humble. You'll never know when it's going to end. But you can be sure of one thing. It is going to end. No matter how wealthy you are, no one has figured out how to keep life going on forever. Except those who trust in God and His promises. Are there things that are more important than money? Are you thinking about it? Are there things that are more important than money? Yes, absolutely. There's things more important than money. Far, far, far more important. One day Jesus told a story on the topic. It's found in Luke 14. The setting was the house of one of the Pharisees. He had been invited there for a Sabbath meal. And verse 7 tells us that Jesus, taking the note of the other guests, watching them and how they were kind of clamoring for the best seats in the house, told a parable. Well, it's called a parable. It sounds like just good advice. I'm going to read it to you from the New Century Version. Luke 14, 6 through 11. You can follow along in whatever version you have, but here's the New Century Version. Jesus said, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, don't take the most important seat because someone more important than you may have been invited. The host who invited both of you will come to you and say, give this person your seat. Then you'll be embarrassed and will have to move to the last place. So when you're invited, go sit in the seat that's not important. When the host comes to you, he may say, friend, move up here to a more important place. Then all the other guests will respect you. All who make themselves great will be made humble. And those who make themselves humble will be made great. I've, uh, I've heard the saying before, and it makes an awful lot of sense. Do not pray to God to humble you. You won't like it when he answers. <laughs> humble yourself. We've been looking at how James reflects the teachings of Jesus. And the story that we just read, Jesus was actually restating Something that's found in Proverbs. So James reflects Jesus. Jesus was restating something from the Old Testament. Listen to Proverbs 25, 6, and 7. See if it sounds like what we just read that Jesus said. Proverbs says, Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that he say to you, Come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince, whom your eyes have seen. Same story, right? And you know, it's amazing to me. I don't know how many people have told me over the years that I've talked with, you know, I'm a New Testament Christian. Jesus died on the cross so the Old Testament could be done away with. That is so absolutely false. In fact, did you know that over 10% of the recorded words of Jesus in the New Testament come directly from the Old Testament? You take away the Old Testament, you've taken away the foundation that the New Testament is built upon. The words of wisdom remind me of a story that a pastor friend told me a few years back. Uh, a rather startling story, a, a unique story. I, in fact, I hope it's unique. I hope it doesn't happen too often. My friend told me of a very wealthy man in his church that was doing something that was causing some dissatisfaction. So a delegation of elders went and talked to this man, a very, very wealthy man in, in the church. And, well, he wasn't doing anything really terrible. 
He was just giving candy out to the kids without asking the parents, was it okay? And so he had been asked a couple of times, you know, please don't do that, but he kept doing it. So the elders went and talked to him and it didn't go over too well. He did stop handing out the candy because he stopped going to church. And now they've got concerns of we've offended brother so-and-so. And so they, a delegation of elders went to the wealthy man to talk to him and see if they could make things right. Well, he didn't make any promises, but he did go to the pastor. And in conversation with the pastor, he had a question for him. Do you want me to come back to church? And what do you think the pastor said? Well, of course I want you to come back to church. So then he said, are you willing to get down on your knees and ask me to come back? <laughs> and the pastor says, absolutely not. Why would you even ask such a thing? Well, your elders did. <laughs> well, that's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> I like to hear, I'm, li I'm liking the comments that I'm hearing. Like, what? Why would he even ask this, my friend told me. And I said, oh, I almost said his name, but I won't say my friend's name. I said, you missed your opportunity. You should have said, absolutely, I'll get on my knees. You should have knelt down right in front of him and says, please join me in prayer as we pray together for humility and serving God together. And my friend says, yeah, Bob. You weren't there. You can think about that. <laughs> In that setting, I was just, what? How can you ask such a question? Uh, Jesus told his story to warn us against making ourselves important. We've seen over and over again how James echoes the teachings of Jesus, and he does it again with this story. But he comes at it from a different direction. Instead of you making yourself important, how are we treating other people? Look with me in James 2 now, as we're still on this subject. Beginning in verse 1, James says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. What is partiality? What he's talking about is playing favorites. Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and play favorites. He continues, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So Jesus says, don't go in and make yourself something. James says, treat everyone the same. If somebody of wealth comes in, don't just fall all over yourself and try and treat them as though they are more. We treat everyone with respect, don't we? It's the same story. But the point that James makes, we should treat everyone with respect. We should treat everyone with dignity. The rich and the famous should not be given preferential treatment over any other person who may walk through the door. We live in a society that's obsessed with rich and famous, don't we? Heroes and idols are created, and celebrities are, are the focus of, of a lot of enjoyment. In fact, have you realized, have you noticed, a lot of what we hear on the news isn't really news at all? It's just gossip about what some rich or famous person is doing? I don't even listen to it, but it was on the news again, whether, whether your dad can be in charge of your estate or not. And the, and the uh, judge decided, no, he can't. You know who I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, is that news? That's not news. It's just gossip. And probably no surprise to you, did you know there's more searches on the internet for celebrities than any other single search? As a young teenager, something happened that impacted my life 
To this very day, it impacted my life. Um, and it started off with, this isn't what impacted my life, but my parents told me, you're allowed to watch one television show a week, as long as your homework's done and your chores are done. You can choose one television show a week to watch. And so I chose a show and I loved this television show. Have you ever heard of Alias Smith and Jones? Alias Smith and Jones, the two most successful outlaws in the history of the West. And I could keep on going with the whole way that that <laughs> uh, series began. I, I love that show. It was a Western starring Pete Duell and Ben Murphy. And Pete Duell, he was Hannibal Hayes in the uh, television show. And in just about every show, it was his wit and wisdom that won the day of whatever took place. He was my hero. I looked up to Pete Duell. I wanted to be like Pete Duell because I was sure he was just like the character that he was portraying online. Not online, there was no online back then. On the television show. <laughs> I wanted to be like him, so I started thinking, maybe I want to become an actor. Maybe I, maybe I can do that. But then on January 1, 1972, the news reported that Pete Duell was dead. He had been found under his Christmas tree, shot in the head by himself. I was stunned. How could this fellow who had it all in my mind have shot himself? What's going on? And so I began to rethink and wonder to myself, what is the path that leads to real happiness? If Pete Duell wasn't happy, the path he was on must not be the path that leads to true happiness. Not too many months later, as we studied poetry in English class, we read and discussed a poem by an American poet, Edwin Robinson. I hadn't heard of before, and I don't know anything else that he wrote, but he wrote a poem called Richard Corey. Have you ever heard the poem Richard Corey? Richard Corey is a startling poem, very much like the startling reality of Pete Duell shooting himself. You familiar with this poem? I'm going to read it to you. It's startling. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed and he was always human when he talked. But still, he fluttered pulses when he said, good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, <laughs> yes, richer than a king and admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the night, and we went without meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. Pete Duell wasn't the only one. And I don't know if Richard Corey was a real person or not, but he tells the story of many people who have found that riches are not, it's not the fairy tale life that many like to look at it as. Riches do not satisfy the longing that's deep within. King David told us that. In fact, he told us what satisfies the longing. It's in Psalms 107. Starting in verse 8, it says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul and feel, fills the hungry soul with goodness. God satisfies the hungry soul. Only God satisfies the hungry soul. James warns, when we treat the rich and the famous different than we would treat anyone else in the same situation, we do them, we do God, and we do ourselves a disservice. In fact, I want you to look at what James calls it in James 2 verse 9. James says, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Showing partiality is what? Showing partiality is sin. 
And I must point out that neither James nor Jesus are speaking against wealth. They're not saying anything about a person having a lot of possessions, a lot of, a lot of money in the bank. In fact, there are some wonderful, godly, humble people in the Bible that were very wealthy, right? What's a name that comes to your mind, someone who was wealthy in the Bible? Abraham? Abraham? Absolutely. He was so wealthy, his, his kids. Isaac was wealthy. Jacob ended up leaving home, but he ended up becoming very wealthy. Who's that? A woman in the Bible, absolutely right. She was very wealthy. And I wrote down several others so that I could think of them. Wealth. Um, King Solomon, King David, extremely, extremely wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea, at the time of Jesus, was a wealthy person. So we're not equating wealth with anything wrong. The issue is, what do you do in your attitude toward wealth? Is wealth your goal? Do you treat people differently based upon their finances? In Mark 10, we find the story of Jesus inviting a very wealthy young man to be one of his disciples. You remember that story? It's the same invitation that he gave to all the other disciples. But Jesus was asking something that was too much for this man. He said, leave what you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. Would he have ended up becoming far more wealthy? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe not in his bank account, not then. But the fellow went away sorrowful. And so far as we know, we never hear from him again. And as he left, Jesus said, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to, the, to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Earlier recorded in Luke 6.10, Jesus had said this, Blessed are you, poor, blessed are you, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Again, James echoes these thoughts. James 2, verse 5, he says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? You know, it sounds to me as if when it comes to salvation, you might be better off to be poor. Because riches can get in the way. I've always appreciated the book of James, and the more I see how united James and Jesus are in, in their message, the more I'm drawn to what James had to say. Here's another example of their unity. Luke 19.10, no, Luke, Leviticus. Where am I getting Luke from? Leviticus 19 verse 18 says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You've heard that before, right? Did Jesus say it? Yeah. You can look it up, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. 39. Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, quoting the Old Testament. James quotes it also. It's in verse 8 of chapter 2. He said, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Treating all with, with respect is at the heart of the message of Jesus, at the heart of the message of James. It's the heart of the message of the Bible. Treat everyone with respect. It's at the very heart of God. God loves all. In chapter 2, James addressed the poor with a warning against partiality. Just before ending his letter, he addressed the rich. So if you turn to James 5, we can see where he's still on the same topic, but he comes back and he talks to the rich. James 5, starting in verse 1, he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And your corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Do you recognize once again? It sounds an awful lot like something Jesus said. 
Yep, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 19 starts off, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and, trust, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. James is saying, you rich people, you've done just what Jesus said not to do. Jesus continued, but, they, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where there neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. James was talking only to a certain group of the rich, not everyone. He was talking to the swindlers. He was talking to the oppressors. He was talking to the dishonest and the selfish. How do I know this? Well, listen to what he continued saying. He says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. So they hired someone, then, they, then he didn't pay them their fair wages. <laughs> and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. God hears those crying out who you've cheated and kept back their honest wages. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have, you have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. You've gotten away with it, but God has watched. Where is your treasure? What is your treasure? Whether rich or poor, God is calling to you. He's calling you to decency. He's calling you to honesty. He's calling you to generosity. He's calling you to care for and treat other people without prejudice, without preferential treatment. And though James doesn't address other prejudices and sinful partialities, we can see that they're all around us, right? Just about anything that could be seen to separate is picked up as a point to divide and to create walls. It can be hair color, it can be eye color, it can be right-handed or left-handed. It can, it can be whether you wear glasses or you don't wear glasses. And uh, I wasn't even thinking about that one until I looked and I saw people with glasses. And I, I, I remember, and I feel bad for it, when I was uh, in elementary school, one of the boys had glasses and we made fun of him. That was totally wrong, wasn't it? Anything can be used to create separation. And we're called not to do that. Galatians 3 verse 28 addresses three specific ones that I want us to look at. Things that are not supposed to cause any separation in the family of God. Galatians 3 verse 28. Well, let's start at verse 26. It says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So what is the three? Jew or Gentile. In other words, our ethnicity, our race, wherever our history comes from, makes no difference in the family of God, does it? We're all one in the same. Male or female, treat everyone the same. We're all equal. We're all equal. It was um, a thought that just came to my mind. You know, it was a dozen years ago or so. Um, as a pastor in the Oregon Conference, we had um, uh, two or three women that were pastors in the conference. And one day at uh, some of the pastors' meetings, I came in just a little bit late, and uh, they had been divided in, into, into circles. Well, I walked up to one of the circles, and there were two women sitting there, an empty chair between them, and then there were a couple of empty chairs among where all the guys were. And I walked in, looked around, and I went over by the women, and I said, may I sit here between you ladies? And they said, you're brave. I said, I am. We've been sitting here from the very beginning, and not a single one of the other guys was brave enough to sit between us. And I said, well, I don't know if it's brave or not, but I like you ladies. I wanted to sit with you. And so, male or female, 
In the family of God, race or ethnicity are not dividing issues. Neither is being male or female. And God never gave permission for anyone to own somebody else, did he? Never. Jesus calls us to be one with him and one with each other. All respected, all valued, all honored. And Jesus refused to submit to the prejudices of his day. And they were there as strong or maybe even stronger in some aspects than what we have today. He treated non-Jews with respect and dignity. He even made a Samaritan a hero of one of his parables. What kind of Samaritan was it? The good Samaritan, thank you. He treated women as important and as equals. He even chose a woman to be the first witness of his resurrection. And did you know in their day, women were not considered eligible to be trusted legal witnesses? If a, witnesses, if a witness was needed for something, eh, it's just a woman talking. <laughs> Jesus chose a woman to be the first witness that he had risen from the dead. And they believed her, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I know. In fact, they didn't believe till he showed up on his own. But he chose her, and that to me is a statement of his respect. Jesus sees us all as one, all valued, all loved, all equal. You are all one in Christ Jesus. That's what we just read in Galatians 3, verse 28. Yet, there's something that Martin Luther King Jr. said 53 years ago. He said, 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in American history. Do you remember him saying that? you remember that story? 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. Why? Where are people at 11 a.m. Sunday morning? In church. In church. Churches tend to be gatherings of people who are the same. But the most important same that any of us have is we have the same love for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, right? Right? That's the most important same, and that's why we're here today. We have that same love, that same interest, that same God, and it brought us together, and nothing else is to divide. No other reason to divide. This morning, I want to share with you something that I'm a little bit proud of. Um, pleased to know, um, it was six years ago that the Pew Research uh, Foundation, is that what it's called? Pew Research Institute, they did a study on racial diversity within the United States and the major religions that we have here. And looking to see of all the churches, when, which ones are the most racially together instead of separated. And I am thankful to tell you that the church on their list that is the most racially diverse in the United States doesn't go to church at 11 o'clock Sunday morning. We're here today. Seventh-day Adventists are right at the top of the list. Who do you think might come in second? Catholics? Um, they're down the list. Number two is Muslim. And that's in America. We're only talking about in America. Number three, Jehovah's Witness. Number four, Buddhist. And then number five is way down when you're looking at the numbers that they use. Uh, these other numbers are a Seventh-day Adventist are 9.1 on the scale, 10 being the most diverse that it could be. Um, all the others are eight. And yes, we get to number five, Catholic. Uh, at 6.7, way down the list. We have some churches, and I'm not going to mention them by name, that are so amazingly one nationality that um, they don't even designate where the other three or four fall uh, that they're looking at. And the categories are white, black, Asian, Latino, and other. I'm thankful that when we meet together 
as Seventh-day Adventists. We're meeting together as one. We are one, and that's what it's all about. And when we look at each other, we may realize, hey, your ancestry comes from another part of the world than where my ancestry came from, but we're all headed to the same place. We're all headed to the same place, thanks to Jesus who made us one flesh, one blood. The message of James and of Jesus is do not get pulled in to prejudice. Do not get pulled into discrimination. Don't play favorites. We are all one. And let's close with James 2 verse 1 on the screen. My brethren, my sisters, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Why would we? Why would we? For a closing song today, do you know the song, We Are One in the Spirit? We're going to sing that together. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one. Yes, they'll know we are Christians.